and all right, there we go. Okay, so hello everybody. My name is Carolyn Phillips and I am thrilled to be presenting today with you, Liz Prasad, uh, as we explore um, what uh, to consider when we're thinking about sanitization of personal durable medical equipment. Uh, DME is what you'll be hearing us say uh, as we move throughout this. Uh, this is a part of our COVID-19 webinar series uh, that we are uh, excited about because these topics came from you. Um, a lot of you have reached out and let us know uh, what it is that you really need to know about, uh, some things that need to be considered uh, as we move through this COVID-19 crisis. And so um, we're very happy to have pulled this together. Uh, thank you to Trish Redman, who helped us uh, in developing a lot of the content uh, and very, very uh, appreciative to have Trevor with us um, from our partner at DefLink. Hello, Trevor. Uh, he is our ASL interpreter. And then also uh, very happy to have Heather who is providing captioning. So I am uh, sir, happy to serve as the Director of Tools for Life and also the Director of Services and Education here at the Center for Inclusive Design and Innovation. And I'm very glad uh, to have Liz Prasad with me. So Liz, uh, I'll turn it to you. There we go. It looks like I was muted. So thank you all for joining us today. So glad to see you on. As Carolyn said, my name is Liz Prasad. I serve as one of the co-principal investigators for this important project, but my everyday role is the program and outreach manager with Tools for Life, which is a program of the Center for Inclusive Design and Innovation here at Georgia Tech. And very excited to talk to y'all today about sanitization of personal DME. Before we get into the content of today's webinar, um, I just wanted to point out a few things just so we can all be comfortable and get ready. Wanted to let everyone know that we're actively recording today's webinar. The webinar recording, transcript, the accessible version of the PowerPoint, and any other additional handouts will be made available to anyone that needs it. So you can absolutely let us know. Wanted to let everyone know that captions are available within Zoom. You can do so by selecting uh, show subtitles, um, or you can click this link for a full view of the captions. And we'll actually get someone, one of our co-hosts, to type this link into the chat for anyone that needs it. Um, we ask that if you are not actively speaking to please mute your microphone. We do have microphone rights um, and we'll be muting folks, but if you could just keep an eye on that, uh, please uh, know that that would be very helpful. Uh, do utilize the chat window to chat with us. Um, we'll get one of our co-hosts again just to type in the chat to say hello, just to put a message in there so you can see it. Um, but please use that to ask questions or post comments throughout the time uh, with us today. There will be an opportunity um, at the end of the presentation for you to unmute your microphone uh, and you can use your raise hand feature to ask any questions during the Q&A portion. Um, and then of course, we've got our interpreter highlighted as well. Um, so again, just another way for folks to connect with us. We wanted to let everyone know that we are offering continuing education credits for today's session. We are actively offering CEUs and CRCs. So CEUs are approved and distributed by the AAC Institute, and CRCs are approved and distributed by the Commission on Counselor Rehabilitation Certification, or CRCC. If you are interested in receiving CEUs and or CRCs, please send an email to this email address, and we'll get someone to type this in the chat as well too, but the email address is training at gatfl.gatech.edu. So training at gatfl.gatech.edu. We're also asking folks to go ahead and type your name, organization, and if you are interested in CRCs or CEUs in the chat window, we just wanna make sure that we have uh, kind of a collective list of folks. Um, so feel free to do that as well too. Um, just so you know, eligible participants will typically receive their credits within two to six weeks after the webinar. So um, again, if you have any questions or need any assistance with that, feel free to reach out to us at that training email address. 
All right, Carolyn. All right, thank you so much, Liz. Uh, we wanna give a big shout out to the CDC Foundation. Um, so big uh, thank you to our funder. Um, this webinar series is made possible to, uh, due to the funding from the CDC Foundation, along with uh, technical assistance from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, so a lot of good information in here. We'll move to the next slide. And I was gonna just talk a little bit about what we're gonna be covering today. Um, we, we definitely wanna talk with you uh, about cleaning and disinfecting surfaces, uh, the importance of that uh, when it comes to preventing the spread of COVID-19. Um, sanitizing devices such as wheelchairs, hospital beds, walkers, canes, crutches, all of that is a top priority for individuals with disabilities. We know that, we hear from you about this, um, who use DME, durable medical equipment, especially during COVID-19 and this pandemic. Uh, this webinar is really designed um, to share up-to-date CDC guidance on how COVID-19 spreads and best practices for cleaning and disinfecting so that folks with disabilities who use DME can protect yourself, protect themselves from infection. Um, we've got some awesome some, uh, material here that we're gonna be going over with you. And we have some learning objectives on our next slide uh, that we wanna make sure that everybody is aware of. Um, we we want to uh, hope, and we hope you will, uh, upon completion of this webinar, um, be able to understand uh, at least two methods uh, that COVID-19 um, is uh, uh, the transmission process there. Um, learn the difference between cleaning and disinfecting um, devices to reduce the risk of getting infected by COVID-19. And then also identify two best practices for cleaning and disinfecting DME during this pandemic. So um, before we get too far down the road, we wanted to uh, let you know who we are. Um, and this is just a screenshot of our website here at the Center for Inclusive Design and Innovation. Uh, we are focused primarily on accessibility and inclusion, inclusion and really making, uh, as we see it, accessibility made smart. Um, uh, we do a lot when it comes to accessibility consulting, uh, specifically for the built environment and for the virtual environment. So we do a lot in that space of information communication technology, ICT uh, accessibility, and then uh, looking at UX, user experience, um, and accessibility. We also provide Braille services, captioning services, described media services, uh, electronic text, e-text um, services, and then we have a certified assistive technology team. Uh, we have a lot of awesome partners and I was just looking through our list and it's great to see so many folks on uh, who have been very interested in this topic in particular. Um, which is great. And so uh, uh, lots of folks who have contributed to this uh, development of this content too. So glad to see uh, Friends of Disabled Adults and Children on uh, along with so many others. And we'll move to the next slide. Um, we do have a video that uh, we have linked here and then you'll see this uh, um, later. And uh, this is an excellent, excellent uh, resource uh, by Peter Axelson. Um, uh, Peter is very well known within our uh, Rehabilitation Engineering Society of North America community. Uh, I actually have met him and know him uh, and Maureen Linden who's on our team uh, knows him very well. So we're going to be referencing a lot of um, his work which is really a uh, true practical application of the CDC guidance on hand washing and also cleaning a manual wheelchair, for example. Um, so we encourage you to check out the video uh, that we have here. Uh, it's a great way also to be able to share this information uh, along with this uh, webinar that you're participating in right now. We'll move to the next slide. So when we're talking about cleaning and disinfecting uh, durable medical equipment, uh, it's, uh, there's a lot to think about there. Um, and there's a whole bunch we wanna think about, um, you know, uh, as we see it, uh, you know, users before COVID-19, before masks and before social distancing. Um, but disinfecting and cleaning was still a part of what we had to do. Uh, there's a bunch of images up here of folks uh, that don't have masks on, that are not um, socially distanced. I don't know about you, but when I'm watching movies now or TV, 
uh, I'm very aware of pre-COVID and post-COVID, and that's very true within our disability community too. Um, but it's great to see these images. Uh, and, and also keep in mind that uh, before COVID-19, during COVID-19, and after, post um, COVID-19, uh, disinfecting and cleaning is still extremely important when we have durable medical equipment involved. Um, the next slide, we just wanted to uh, give you uh, just a little bit uh, of more information and also um, re refer you, you know, get you to uh, the CDC, um, their frequently asked questions area specifically. Um, but the pandemic that we're facing, it is caused by a virus um, and uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, COV right? Um, and so it's the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome uh, Coronavirus 2 is what that is. Um, the disease is caused, it causes is called coronavirus disease 19. Um, the abbreviation is actually, you know, COVID-19. That's what we see uh, everywhere. Uh, there has been some confusion about that, um, but we encourage you uh, as we do uh, to go back and um, reference the awesome CDC guidance and, and also stay up to date uh, with all that information that they have, um, especially right here with the frequently asked questions. We'll move to the next slide. So there are a lot of threats out there, and we've known this uh, for years, uh, threats that you can't see. And COVID-19 and some other organisms that are not visible to the naked eye uh, really pose those infection threats. Um, some of those that uh, we've, you know, want to make sure that you're aware of um, that are things we cannot see would be the viruses, right? So colds, cold sores, uh, chicken pox, mumps, flu, many others. Uh, bacteria is another thing to consider uh, of things that we cannot see. Um, common infections um, like anthrax, tuberculosis, um, strep, staph, you know, those types of things um, are more in that bacteria family. And then of course, um, fungi, right? Molds, mildew, uh, they absolutely uh, can become a threat to people with allergies, um, and especially when buildings become contaminated. Uh, so just keeping these things in mind um, as we're talking about why sanitization and why cleaning and disinfecting is so important. We'll move to the next slide where we can actually dive a little bit deeper and thinking about what actually lives on surfaces, um, viruses on solid surfaces. And as you know, uh, a lot of our durable medical equipment has, uh, we have a lot of solid surfaces that, uh, you know, are different parts of our DNA. So um, the flu, influenza, seasonal virus uh, poses a significant risk every year, um, and it can survive up to 48 hours, you know, two days basically on hard surfaces. Um, neurovirus, a common cause of, uh, you know, gastro, uh, those types of outbreaks on cruise ships, um, survives on solid surfaces up to two weeks. Very important um, to consider. Uh, and then uh, COVID-19 virus may survive uh, from one to three days on solid surfaces. Um, we've got some good information and you know, here uh, to think about when it comes to solid surfaces and why we need to consider this. Uh, and we also, um, throughout the whole presentation, uh, have uh, shown you where we cited and where we got this information. So, um, and CDC has given us some really good information. Uh, and then, of course, other um, PubMed, uh, you know, there's some other resources there too. So possible paths uh, to COVID-19 infection. Uh, we know now a whole bunch more than we knew, um, you know, back in January and February uh, about how this does actually, you know, transmit and what are some of the paths. Um, close contact or airborne transmission is one to consider and something to consider here between people who are in close contact with one another. And so, um, you know, within six feet. So we're hearing obviously um, more, much more than six feet is where we need to be. Um, through respiratory droplets produced when an infected person coughs or sneezes, breathes, sings, or even talks. Under certain circumstances, um, 
for example, when people are enclosed uh, within spaces with poor ventilation, COVID-19 sometimes can be spread by airborne transmission. So keep those things in mind. The other thing to consider is contact with surfaces, including devices, right? So hand to face. Um, COVID-19, we know, um, spreads less commonly through contact with contaminated surfaces. Uh, so that is touching a surface with a virus on it than touching eyes, mouth, or nose. So once again, um, we encourage you, uh, and we've referenced here, uh, how COVID-19 spreads. Uh, which, once again, that awesome CDC guidance. And we'll move to the next slide. So um, today, as we're considering how to clean safe uh, and safely use equipment with surfaces uh, that may come into contact with the virus that causes COVID-19, um, we definitely want you to, you know, think about how we're protecting ourselves from this. According to the CDC, touching a surface that has the virus on it is not the most likely way. So that's very important for folks to know. So not the most likely way a person will get the virus. We're more likely to get the virus by being too near to an infected person and inhaling the virus. And that's why it helps to wash your hands, wear a mask, and practice social distancing. But it is possible to get COVID-19 and other diseases from contact with contaminated surfaces. And we'll move to the next slide. So when we're talking about um, durable medical equipment, sometimes people don't always know exactly what we're talking about. Uh, that could be um, a range of items that are included. It's canes and crutches, as I said, walkers, um, motorized wheelchairs and scooters. It also includes the whole uh, family of nebulizers and oxygen therapy. It could be bath and shower chairs, toilet safety rails, uh, those elevated toilet seats, um, transfer boards, and benches. Uh, sometimes um, we'll even see CPAP uh, devices and BiPAP devices in there, along with, uh, you know, those, those hospital beds of all sizes and all shapes. So DME, durable medical equipment, it's an item that can be used over and over, and it really helps an individual uh, who has a disability, an injury, a functional limitation, an illness. Uh, sometimes um, it's called home med medical equipment. Uh, Chris Brand over at Friends of Disabled Adults and Children, uh, they often refer to their equipment as home medical equipment. Um, it may also be uh, used anywhere that the individual goes. So some of this is portable, some of it, you know, is actually in the home. DME may be needed temporarily, you know, it could be a short-term uh, injury or illness, or for a permanent uh, condition that somebody might have. So uh, thinking about that, we just wanted to make sure that uh, we're all on the same page here as to what DME is. So the guidelines uh, for the CDC, um, they are uh, you know, a source of authoritative guidance uh, for preventing the transmission of disease. Um, I know everywhere in the world that I've traveled, <laughs> I see the CDC guidelines um, that was pre-COVID, um, but I would see the CDC guidelines uh, popping up in all different languages all over the world. Uh, it's very, very cool to see that. Um, how well respected uh, these guidelines are. So a piece of home medical equipment uh, is a non-critical patient care devices um, category. So as opposed to surgical instruments that require sterilization under the CDC guidelines. That's because the devices should not contact uh, mucous membranes uh, or get used inside the body. DME should not require sterilization, and uh, sometimes people are a little confused about that. But it does need to be cleaned and disinfected. Um, together, a process called sanitization, right? Uh, most home medical devices do not require sterilization, but they do need to be cleaned and disinfected. And the cleaning and disinfection of a device should be done in a manner that removes the risk of transmission of disease. And we'll move to the next slide. So 
when we're thinking about all of this, there's some terms we want to make sure that you're aware of. Um, cleaning is the removal of germs, dirt, trash, and what have you, from surfaces by brushing, picking, or washing it away. Disinfecting is the use of a special chemical or a combination of that in water, a spray or a wipe to kill germs after cleaning. So there's a process here. Um, sanitization is both cleaning and disinfection uh, together, right? So, uh, and we should do both uh, to make sure that devices are safe and uh, can be used at home in a safe way. We'll move to the next slide. So when we're thinking about all of this, it's helpful to have a framework. Um, so a framework for sanitization. A good plan uh, for home device sanitization includes um, procedures based on compliance with authoritative recommendations. That is, you know, obviously uh, from the CDC or what have you. Um, definitely from the CDC. In an appropriate place to, uh, an appropriate place to clean the devices safely. So you want to have that space. Uh, selection and use of appropriate tools and supplies. So you want to make sure you have, have those available and, and ready. Uh, communication about safety and procedures for household members and caregivers. Uh, we've seen those actually written out, uh, which is a great way to go. Um, so, uh, and even posted in a convenient location. Uh, and then also a secure place to store the cleaners and disinfectants, right? So having that framework and, and having uh, also a timeline around all of that uh, so that you're able to go through a process and also ensure that this happens on a regular basis. If we uh, move to the next slide, what you'll find here is the official guidance for disinfecting devices. And there's four components. Um, manufacturer guidelines uh, for device care. Um, Pretty much every manufacturer out there when it comes to DME uh, offers guidance for cleaning the device in a manner that protects the materials uh, of which it's made. Um, we also uh, have some great guidance, once again, from the CDC when it comes to uh, guidelines for non-critical disinfection. Um, and although it's designed for healthcare, we've been able to glean a lot of good information um, when it comes to the basics for non-critical devices, uh, th as in those that are used at home. Uh, CDC also has some great guidelines for cleaning and disinfection for households, and this provides uh, general recommendations for routine cleaning and disinfection for um, households where somebody with COVID may live. And then OSHA um, also has bloodborne pathogen standards uh, and some guidelines there. And uh, that is actually designed to protect workers, right? Uh, but the guidance is generally applied to address blood spills or what have you, and that, that does occur. Uh, so just being mindful of that. And then of course, uh, the EPA has approved disinfectants on list N is what they call that. Um, it's a list of registered products that meet the standards for disinfection. So you also wanna make sure that as you're going through that cleaning, and that disinfecting that you're actually using uh, disinfectants that are on that list. Um, there's some, uh, all of these have links. And so just being mindful of that. Liz, do you want to jump in? Uh, I just now, I just now got on. So oh. let me, let me get caught up here. Okay. Oh, <laughs> um, Liz Prasad, do you want to jump in? Yes, I would be happy to. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, I appreciate you covering all of those and they're all very important. Um, I've got the next slide pulled up here that talks a little bit about following manufacturer's guidelines. Um, as somebody who is a personal DME user, uh, don't throw away any of your um, manuals that come with your chairs and your canes and your walkers and crutches and hospital beds. That can often happen, but if you've got the user manual your device, read and follow the instructions for cleaning. They're absolutely uh, very helpful. Um, absolutely encourage all of you to check the website of the manufacturer for 
the manual. Um, and if you don't have the user guide, just uh, keep that model number on your device handy. It goes a long way for many years to come. Um, you'll be able to find all sorts of helpful information as well too. Um, and if you don't follow the maker's directions, the warranty on the device um, could be voided. So we just wanna encourage you all to be very mindful of those pieces as well too. Um, when it comes to the manufacturer guidelines, obviously the company that made the equipment knows which materials were used and what might harm the finish of the parts. Um, those of you that uh, um, you know are very familiar with DME, you know that there's all different aspects of, to all different aspects to it: plastic, rubber, um, sometimes cloth pieces on it. So just want to be very mindful of that. Um, hard surfaces may be made from metal composites or rigid plastic. So again, just keeping all of those pieces in mind. Uh, like I said, soft surfaces may be rubber, vinyl, fabric. Um, you don't wanna use harsh chemicals on that. Um, so being mindful of maybe putting things um, you know, to wash first. So just uh, uh, being mindful of all those things. And then of course, um, I think we all know this, that water should never get into the electrical or electronic parts um, have been there and done that and we definitely don't want that to happen. So be very mindful of that and trying to keep all of those pieces safe and dry as you're cleaning your equipment. Um, of course, there's so much to be done when it comes preparation to when you're cleaning your devices. So obviously uh, we've got CDC guidance here and as Carolyn mentioned, um, we've got uh, sites, citations and links at the bottom that y'all can go and check for some of that guidance even further. Um, but the CDC recommends three practices for safe use of devices at home. And so of course, um, we're all doing this and we continue to encourage everyone to uh, do proper hand washing, um, also proper cleaning and disinfection of equipment. And then of course, safe storage of cleaned and disinfected devices. So we wanna make sure that once our devices are cleaned and disinfected that they're not being stored with some of our dirtier devices um, that we're initially working with. Um, the OSHA Bloodborne Pathogen Standard um, is listed here. The Bloodborne Pathogen Standard, it applies to all exposures to blood and other potentially infectious material um, and about how to handle all of that, uh, all of that waste. Um, so really it's about uh, folks being able to protect themselves, especially if you might be exposed. Um, and so all of this guidance is standard and it's uh, uh, typically applied in workplaces, but we wanted to be able to um, just highlight this. So, because it, uh, th these are things that can absolutely happen. So devices used by persons infected with viral, bacterial, or fungal infections may pose a threat to caregivers and other users of the devices if they become contaminated with those live pathogens. So again, just being mindful of um, those aspects as well. Um, Carolyn talked a little bit about the EPA list N, and so we wanted to highlight the disinfectants for home use. So of course, disinfectants improved for COVID-19 will be on that EPA list N. And of course, we've got that resource link in here as well too, and those are all things that you're able to find online as well. And so there's just a little arrow drawing here so you can see what that looks like on the label on the back of our disinfectants and cleaning products as well too. The list is organized by chemical name, not by brand, so that can be challenging to most of us. Um, uh, approved disinfectants have an EPA number on the product label, C label. So as you can see here, the arrow is showing that it says EPA, REG, and no, and then some numbers there. So that's exactly what you wanna look for um, as you're looking for the EPA list N. So when it comes to choosing cleaning products, uh, there's all sorts of things that you want to consider. Um, over on the right hand side, we have a picture of some empty shelves at a store. I think this is something that we've all encountered at some point during these past few months uh, during this pandemic. But that is absolutely a problem that we're all dealing with, which is availability 
of products. Um, it's still difficult to find antibacterial wipes, rubbing alcohol, things like that. Um, so being mindful of all that. Um, but you want to consider these couple of points when it comes to choosing the cleaning products uh, for your durable medical equipment. So looking at effectiveness of the product, um, looking at convenience, um, you do want to think about the residual effects on surface materials. So just going back a few moments ago, about all the different parts of your DME, um, what does that look like? And so making sure that you're using appropriate cleaners on appropriate parts. Um, the human and environmental considerations. So just being, uh, again, mindful of who's around uh, the environment, making sure that you're well ventilated, you've got separate spaces for contaminated, dirty equipment versus clean equipment. And then of course, just the cost. So again, just important factors to be thinking about um, as you're tuning your cleaning, choosing your cleaning products. Um, so some information up here when it comes to disinfectants for home use and just some helpful tips. Uh, commonly used disinfectants that you might already have at home, uh, bleach and alcohol. Um, and so we've got here just some of the ratios that you want to use. And again, we encourage all of you just to be very mindful of um, using these products, especially in your home, making sure that everything is well ventilated. But when it comes to bleach, obviously this needs to be diluted with water. Um, and typically what that looks like is about five tablespoons or a third of a cup of 5.25 to 8.25% bleach per gallon of room temperature water. Or that can also look like four teaspoons of 5.25 to 8.25% bleach per quart of room temperature water. So just some helpful information here, but as always, we encourage everyone to take a look at some of those guidelines on the CDC website. And of course, when it comes to alcohol, at least 70%. Helpful tips, again, look for the EPA registration number on the product label. And then of course, you wanna check that number against that list N that we just talked about. Um, use of personal protective equipment or PPE is very important. Um, I think we all know that, but of course we wanna be just extra cautious as we are working on cleaning um, our equipment. So all individuals handling devices used by an infected person should have PPE appropriate for handling and cleaning medical devices or AT or assistive technology. Masks are the most frequently recommended PPE for most, the commercially made surgical mask of woven, woven fibers or three-layer fabric mask is suitable. Um, all, of course, fabric masks should always be washed after every use. Um, we do have a helpful YouTube video here as well, too. I um, wanted to mention that gloves, including disposable gloves, um, can be very helpful for protecting skin from disinfectants. We just wanted to encourage everyone and remind you how important it is that you change your gloves after each device that is cleaned or disinfected. Um, because obviously you're wearing a glove, you're touching a device, you're moving over to a clean device, you don't wanna transfer any of the virus or any contaminants over with you. So of course the use of personal PPE is very important. And again, there's just more guidance here at the bottom of this slide. And we have a slide at the end that's also um, with all these links as well to you, but just points you back to CDC guidance, um, which is very important to check out. Supplies and tools are very important. Uh, cleaning and disinfection requires access to appropriate supplies and tools, and so we have some helpful uh, tips when it comes to just thinking about what tools, what supplies you need in your home um, for cleaning your DME. And so we've got an image here, just again, general cleaning tools and supplies. Uh, there's a, a photo here in the middle of a bucket. Looks like there's a glove draped over there, a little spray bottle. Um, looks like some soap, a brush, sponge, and a little rag. Um, so over on the right, just the list, um, you know, it's important to have a bucket or spray bottle so that way you can mix your cleaning solutions. Um, utility gloves that can be washed or those disposable gloves that we discussed a soft brush to remove stubborn dirt. Um, you wanna be protective of your equipment, but you also wanna make sure that you're able to get into those crevices and nooks and crannies to get all that dirt out. 
cloths, face cloths, or microfiber towels to wet and rinse cleaner from surface as well. Those are all very important to have. And then of course, we wanna encourage everyone to remind you that you wanna allow the surface to air dry thoroughly. Uh, think about keeping tweezers, little picks. I know Carolyn mentioned that earlier for trap debris. Um, DME has all sorts of intricate moving pieces. So um, it's important to get down into those nooks and crannies, if you will, to pull all of that gunk out. Uh, preparing a cleaning station at home. Uh, obviously, that's important if we're going to be bringing this equipment or we have this equipment in our home. We want to be mindful of having an area um, that you could, you know, store the equipment, clean it, and then move it to a clean space as well. So just again, some helpful tips. Uh, a garage would be great, um, but you know, not everybody has a garage. Um, just think about needing adequate space to clean in the device. You, know, you could use a sink or a tub, but again, just be mindful that bigger equipment like shower chairs, even hospital beds, power chairs, they are going to require more space. Protect the floors if needed with a waterproof tarp. Um, have a sink and faucet nearby for water and for disposal of chemicals. Um, and again, just want to be mindful of that piece, if appropriate, as indicated by the label. So we encourage you just to not dump your chemicals, but be mindful of paying attention to the instructions um, and making sure that um, you're disposing of them properly. Gather cleaning tools and supplies. Review all the safety guidance for all cleaners and all chemicals. Have your personal protective gear ready um, and before you start. Um, be sure to unplug and remove batteries before cleaning. Don't forget, a lot of our DME, um, they operate. So those of us that use DME can move on our own and be independent. A um, little bit of water getting in a joystick or in the battery can be a headache for quite some time. So be very mindful to unplug and remove those batteries. Be very mindful of those electronic parts. Um, and then, of course, don't use power devices near water. I think we all know that, but just want to put that out there and make sure that y'all remember. Um, so when it comes to just general uh, tips for cleaning DME, um, if the device has been used outdoors, it may be difficult to clear all dirt, debris, string, um, hair. That hair is a big one, y'all. It gets down in those wheels. Um, so again, just think about using tweezers or a pick. Um, visible stains should be removed first using a detergent, not a disinfectant. It could be a spray and wipe product, product that doesn't require rinsing or a cleaner that mixes water. And again, that's specifically for stains on fabric. Um, clean the piece of equipment with the solution of mild detergent and water using a damp cloth. All surfaces, including those on the bottom, should be wiped thoroughly. And of course, after wiping, the device should be allowed to air dry at least 10 minutes before permitting anything to come into contact with the surface. You just want to make sure that all those solutions, all the cleaners, all the soap, everything has been rinsed off and everything is dry and ready to go. Disinfecting after cleaning, after the device has been cleaned and dried, this is when you want to apply disinfectant wipe or cloth sprayed with a disinfectant. So you're going to have your washcloth or your wipe, you're going to spray it down with a disinfectant. So after you've done the process of cleaning, picking, um, cleaning stains off fabric, this is when you'll use that cloth with a disinfectant to wipe down. Contact time is critical for effective destruction of the virus. So again, we just encourage you all to read the directions and be sure to allow enough time. Allow the device to air dry. And again, as always, I know we're repetitive with this, um, but we've seen it time and time again in our community. When your devices are clean, store them away from dirty devices. So keeping two separate areas. Applying sanitization guidance. Um, so we mentioned earlier that Peter Axelson, founder of Beneficial Designs and also a wheelchair user, um, offers very practical, uh, helpful recommendations for cleaning and disinfecting um, your wheelchair. Um, and of course, one of the most frequently used DME devices 
this is, that many will have a video here. It's beneficialdesigns.com. Um, we're not going to show the video just in the interest of time, but we do want to point this out to y'all. It's a great video of Peter in his chair, in his home. It's very real. I think it shows just what we're all, you know, dealing with. We're at home and we need to figure out how we can clean our devices at home in our minimal spaces. So we definitely encourage you all to check it out. Um, even though we're not showing the video, just wanted to highlight a couple points from it that Peter mentions. Uh, this is a slide, this is an image, and something I think about quite often as somebody who is a power chair user. Um, we are in a more vulnerable position. I've thought about this many times. I've been in this kind of gross little position here. Um, Peter notes that wheelchair users are always lower in position than people who are standing, and that does leave uh, people who use wheelchairs vulnerable to airborne viruses, uh, virus from sneezing and coughing. Um, again, I think about that often just uh, moving through crowds prior to the pandemic and what that looked like, um, and that's absolutely true. Social distancing, even when you're wheelchair users is very important, especially for that self-protection. A COVID clean for manual wheelchairs. So there's an image here on the right hand side of an individual sitting in a manual wheelchair. Um, and then this just points out the different important parts of that manual wheelchair. So um, just moving uh, clockwise, you've got push handles, arm supports, your wheel locks, removable su uh, foot supports, tires and then hand rims, which are a very important piece to somebody using a manual wheelchair. Uh, Peter noted key parts of a wheelchair that need appropriate cleaning include wheels that touch floors, sidewalks, parking lots, and then of course eventually the user's hands. Um, a helpful tip, most of the cleaning and disinfection practices can be applied to other non-powered DME, such as canes, crutches, walkers, bath, and shower items. So uh, just a helpful tip that uh, the way you're cleaning your manual wheelchair, you can more than likely use uh, those uh, protocols for cleaning uh, some other uh, non-powered DME as well. Peter uh, shares his hand routine for cleaning those hand rims on his manual chair. Um, and here's a quote from Peter, but he says, I get two washcloths or paper towels wet with some antibacterial soap and push my wheelchair around the house, sliding the washcloths on the hand rims as I go. I push my chair about 20 feet, six meters, or spin around in circles if I am in a public bathroom. Pushing 20 times, pushing 20 feet, wipes the hand rims three times. It can be a bit tricky to learn how to do this. You can have someone slowly push you to make it easier. This allows me to clean the hand rims of my wheelchair. So over on the right, you can see uh, just a sketch. It's got someone sitting in a power chair and they're holding those washcloths, um, those rags in their hand as they're spinning their wheel. So again, it might be beneficial um, if you need a little assistance to have somebody help you out. But again, and just a helpful tip for um, covering some of that important spots on a manual chair that can really get in someone's hands. Uh, changing how we handle devices at home. Um, it's important just to be thinking differently um, as we are going through this pandemic and important points to consider doing differently during COVID. Um, everyone should wash hands before handling devices. Obviously, you want to limit contact with other objects. Um, clean devices after every trip out of the home. Um, again, I'm a power wheelchair user. Um, I am in quarantine. I am not really going out, but if I have to go to a doctor's appointment, um, if there's some place I absolutely have to go, as soon as I get home, my caregivers help me wipe down joysticks and we wipe down the important pieces on my power chair that others and myself would be touching. Um, it's an it's an extra um, kind of chore, but again, it's better safe um, and not risking anything as well. Um, obviously, clean devices before storing. And then again, I know we're repetitive about this, but store devices separately. Oftentimes, you can bag them, uh, put some plastic over it, clean plastic, and put them in a clean area. Um, sanitization of devices protects people who come into contact with the device against uh, acquiring an infection. 
Um, and obviously that is what we need to do to safeguard our health and minimize law school or work time. Um, sanitization protects users of the device. It also protects caregivers. There are many of us that use DME that we're not on our own. We have a team of support uh, folks that are with us. And so we wanna make sure that our support uh, people are our support circles are protected as well because they're touching our DME and our devices just as much sometimes if not more than we are as well too. Sanitization protects workers who come into contact with the device. Um, we've got some helpful tips again when it comes to tools and procedures to avoid. So again unplug all your electrical devices, um, be mindful of that water coming near your device devices. Uh, be very mindful of their wet floor and uh, uh, the risk of falling as well. Um, so again, just be very careful of all those things. Um, avoid using tools that may promote the spread of virus. So with compressed air, uh, that's been something that folks have uh, asked about. We don't want to use compressed air from a compressor or a can because you're basically just kind of blowing it and fanning it out. Um, you don't want to have fans in the work area um, and then high pressure hoses that may aerosol aerosolize excuse me the virus while removing it may also spread it to a larger area so again just some safety tips tools and procedures that we want to be mindful of and to stay away from so just right before we wrap up again more helpful tips again we want to just encourage you all to keep shared services and devices clean. So devices should always be sanitized between uses or regularly if used at all times. I will say that that's something I've noticed since uh, uh, the pandemic is that uh, my care team is clean. They're cleaning my devices at home more um, multiple times a day between uses. But even if they're just walking around with some Lysol, just squirt it spray it and keep it clean and safe. Um, it's become habit and it's something I'm very grateful for. Um, we're also very mindful of just cleaning and disinfecting with a disinfectant wipe after um, every use. And we're, we're mindful to wipe down doorknobs, faucets, uh, drawer pulls, handles, knobs, remote controls, controls on shared devices, such as your stove, your microwave, your refrigerator, um, soap, sanitizer, lotion, dispensers. Um, Y'all, I know it's a lot and that seems like everything we own in our home, but again, we want to keep that risk minimal and especially if you are an individual with a disability, you are using DME, you do have um, others helping you, it's very, you have to be very mindful of, you know, high traffic areas in keeping um, into consideration cleaning all of these important pieces. Uh, shared devices, telephones, keyboards, copiers, printers, risk the transmission of the virus if one person using the device has COVID-19. So again, wanna be mindful of that. Device manufacturers may make recommendations for the proper care and cleaning of devices used in home care. So again, we always encourage you just to go back, look at those manuals, get in touch with the manufacturer um, and be mindful of those recommendations. And then of course, cleaning recommendations may be found in those user manuals. So keep them on, on hand, uh, check back on those websites, all very, very helpful. Carolyn, anything else that you'd like to add? I just wanna add that I'm always learning from you. The great examples and, and I agree that uh, that's one of the questions that people ask ask is how often and it's it's a daily multiple times a day um, event for a lot of folks when it comes to cleaning and and truly that sanitization process so um, and, and I'm thrilled that so many folks are on with us from across the country uh, and and being able to implement this is really uh, where we want folks to um, you know to get that information and, and get it out so that uh, everybody can stay safe um, so does anyone have any questions for us? Um, we're happy to answer. And great job, Liz. Good information. As folks might be unmuting their microphone or typing in the chat, and please, we encourage you all to type your questions and comments in the chat. Um, we just wanted to highlight that we are hosting even more webinars and we're excited to bring this COVID-19 series um, out to all of you. So 
um, the next webinar is going to be on December 9th at two o'clock and this one's focused on face masks and people with disabilities. On December 16th, we're going to take a closer look at mental health and resilience within, this, the, within the disability community during the time of COVID-19. Um, and then looking at the new year, January 20th, we're excited about this one. This is all about making social media accessible for people with disabilities. And so we've got some awesome folks that are going to be joining us for that. And then in early uh, February of next year, a closer look at guidance for businesses and employers considering the needs of people with disabilities during COVID-19. So um, again, we encourage all of y'all to uh, be on the lookout for those webinar announcements, but join us um, and please share the word as well too. So great information that we've got for y'all. Oh, but yes, very excited about all of those. Uh, it looks like we are getting some um, great tips and also uh, some questions in the chat. All hey, right. this is Sam, I can read some of the questions that are in the chat. We have a comment from Fodak that says, one thing we do is fog the common areas to kill viruses. Excellent. Thank you, Fodak. And uh, that is a great thing that we're starting to see a lot of folks do. So thank you very much for sharing that. We have a comment or a question from Leanne that says, many of my DD, hold on, I'm getting, I'm scrolling down. Many of my DD clients use CPAP, the automatic cleaners, are they effective for COVID-19? This is Trish. Do you want me to answer that one? That would be great. Yes, please. <laughs> I'm Trish Redman, and my sister is a uh, director of a sleep lab for a long time. If you're thinking about the devices, for example, the SoClean, the automated devices, those are effective, especially for cleaning hoses, but it doesn't relieve you of the responsibility of cleaning the surfaces of your CPAP or BiPAP device housing. So uh, it's very helpful compared to the standard protocol of cleaning hoses with a vinegar water solution, which is what's always been recommended, but you still need to take a surface disinfectant wipe and leave it long enough as you clean the outside housing of the machine itself. Thank you, Trish. That's great. Sam, what else? We have a question from Meg that says, how much additional staff time should state HCBS and CFC programs add for these support activities? What resources are needed to implement these practices that may need for Appendix K or SPA? Comments? Yes, um, thank you so much for the question. We are seeing an uptick definitely uh, in the amount of time and resources of people uh, that are needed um, to support uh, these important activities. Um, you know, there's higher demand in, in, and also it's prevention. That's what it's about. Um, so we're seeing that change. It depends on, uh, you know, uh, across different states and also um, just within, uh, you know, how much equipment does the person actually have, how active is the person, uh, and so we're finding that it really comes down to each person, so, and uh, happy to talk in much more detail about that, of what we've seen. So we can move to the next question, hope that helps. Another question we have is, uh, electronics are really difficult to sanitize, especially communication devices. Any suggestions? Oh yes, um, I am in that space uh, with you. Um, uh, my daughter uses a communication device and we have to clean it uh, all the time, many, many, many times throughout the day. Um, so once again, uh, using the protocols for the hard surfaces, plastics, all of that, um, you know, that we've discussed here. Uh, also using um, wipes that won't uh, destroy like the screen and, and all of those, uh, um, you know, more fine uh, tune pieces, uh, very, very important. Um, so yes, yeah, so thinking about kind of what we would use uh, for cleaning phones or, you know, uh, mobile phones, what have you. Um, yeah, and it's uh, multiple, multiple times during the day. 
All right, our next question is, is there DME cleaning equipment that SILs or other providers can purchase with CARES Act funds to support adherence to these important protocols? Yes, um, absolutely. Uh, you know, there are um, big devices that are out there, um, kind of like, uh, uh, you know, FODAC and um, Project MEN. Several of our partners around the country actually have these um, Walton Options um, have these on site, uh, you know, and, and some of them are portable well, where they can actually take them out into the community. Um, you know, they're, they're like uh, hub scrubs is it's one of one of the kinds that's out there. Um, but there are a lot when it comes to, uh, you know, that more, um, you know, personal, you know, what you would have at home. Uh, and we, once again, we are seeing that a lot of that has been approved um, because it is about prevention, it is about health, um, and even the PPE has started to be covered uh, by some of the waivers and what have you. Um, and the CARES Act funding, uh, which is great. It's a great use for that type of funding, absolutely. All right, our next question is, do you know how much alcohol or Lysol to add to a box of diaper wipes to use for sanitizing? Liz, do you know the answer to that? I don't. Um, I, I don't know the answer. Um, I know that in the presentation we had uh, what it would look like for the bleach ratio um, and alcohol at 70%, um, but I don't know specifically um, for a box of diaper wipes. All right, we have another question that says, we work for a home care. Do you provide a note to our company to get credit? Um, if you're asking about um, the credits that we're offering for the webinar, um, please send us an email at the training email address and we can get someone to type that in the chat and we'll be happy to talk to you offline. All right, another question we have is how do you clean communication devices that are used for the deaf? So once again, what you want to think about um, are those individual components. Um, you know, is it plastic? Is it metal? Uh, is it glass? Um, a lot of the communication devices that uh, are utilized for folks who are deaf, um, you know, it's a combination of those things, sometimes even tubing, sometimes uh, some electronics. So uh, thinking about the parts and then actually um, using, uh, you know, the, the chemicals as needed, making sure that you're not going to break down some of the electronics or what have you. Um, and, and then also uh, just, you know, as sometimes it's just as simple as having those wipes and using them uh, you know, consistently so that uh, uh, you can keep it clean. So, um, yeah, that, so there's a, a lot of good information uh, that's obviously in this um, presentation, but also some of the, those resources that we gave you, once again, pointing to um, the CDC uh, guidelines. Sometimes we don't see the, the item actually named, but um, what we do see is, uh, you know, more, here's how you clean plastic, here's how you clean metal. And so, yes, so sometimes we have to get creative about that. And I'm very aware that we are at time, um, and I'm seeing so many great uh, comments. Once again, Liz, excellent job. Um, great job, team. Um, and, and we do hope that you will fill out the evaluation. Liz, anything else that you want to add as we wrap up? Thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, we just put in a note about emailing us for credits and to indicate if you need CEUs or CRCs, but we hope that this was very helpful for all of you. We know it's a lot of information and uh, we appreciate your time and joining us and we just encourage all of you all to continue to stay safe and healthy out there. That is great. And um, I did, uh, there are two comments here that I just listened to um, with my uh, assistive technology. One is a question about light, um, UVA light, UV light. Uh, and honestly, um, uh, that is something that, uh, you know, there's so many questions still to that. It doesn't really clean crevices, things like that. So um, we, we have not recommended that and, and we, you know, so uh, happy to discuss that in more detail. Um, the other question is how do you uh, ask someone to wear a mask uh, that is around you? And we're actually going to have a whole webinar about masks. Um, and, and that one is coming up soon, actually. Uh, that one is uh, December 9th. Um, and 
And so uh, we absolutely will be addressing that. And thanks for the question. Um, and once again, we point everybody to the CDC guidance uh, uh, that is out there about masks. So um, thank you all. Thank you, Trevor. Excellent interpreting. Thank you, Heather. Excellent captioning. And thank you, um, Liz and Trish and Sam. I really appreciate everything. Y'all take care. Be safe. Thank you.